Hello and welcome to another video. Today I want to talk about something I was asked very very often in the comments, which is what tools do I use for fixing electronics. One of the most asked tools was this thing here. This is a 24 pin adapter. This thing gets 12 volts as an input and goes to your usual 24 pin ATX with an 8 pin CPU attached to it. So this thing came originally with only this thing attached to it, which is an 8 pin 6 pin GPU adapter or 6 pin GPU plug. As you can see, there's only two occupied, one with ground and one with 12 volts. And what I did is I took those two pads where the original wires attached and attached my own, own ones onto there, onto 12 volts on ground. And I color marked them at the end, as you can see, with blue and with red for 12 volts and for ground. And I'm using that to measure the current what a board draws. This also has a very neat SATA uh, to it, SATA power and Molex power. So you have everything in one package drawn from 12 volts. This has CPU 8 pin, SATA Molex and 24 pin ATX. There's nothing else you have to adapt because this thing does all the voltages. It does 5 volts, minus 12 volts, 3.3 volts. Everything is connected through this thing here. This has multiple buck converters. I haven't designed this thing myself. I just bought it. And this is the 160 watt capacity adapter. There are different ones that do like up to 300 watts, I think. But the limiting factor is not this thing, but my power supply. My Lab bench power supply only does 10 amps at 12 volts, which means 120 watts. I can't really tell you if this thing takes the 12 volts and converts it again, or if it just passes the 12 volts on, but I'm going to be safe with the 10 amps I can draw from my power supply. So you can buy this thing online. This is originally a mining adapter. Uh, people got to know this thing as a mining adapter. And um, one quick thing, I made these cables longer because it was too short for my taste and for most mainboards. So what this is supposed to plug into is this big thing that you might have seen already. This is an HP server power supply. This thing has, I believe, 1200 or 1500 watts, I think. Something ridiculously high for this small. Let me see, it is 1200 watts at 240 volts, as you can see right there. It has up to 100 amps maximum on the 12 volt side. So, what you would do is, this is a breakout board, usually used for mining. This is the output of the HP power supply. This would be 12 volts and ground and some standby voltages. This, is, this thing here that I use is called a breakout board. And this breaks out to 6-pin adapters, GPU 6-pin. The ones that you would take here and plug into there. And this is how it would get its 12 volts. This switch is just to be powered on. And this display you can, uh, that you can see here would show you the voltage. So this I use when I need more juice. When 10 amps isn't enough, I just put it into this and I can utilize the full 160 watts coming from this thing. I am looking forward to getting a 300 watt one because this thing can supply the, uh, the whole 300 watts and way more that I could draw through an, an adapter like this. For starting main boards, this thing will be way more than enough because I have not seen any main board draw 10 amps on startup. I've seen like 7 or 8, but that is with coolers, with LEDs, and with the basic GPU in it. You can draw up to like 9 amps, but never, I've never gone over the 10 amps with this adapter here. So for fixing mainboards, this is great, because after you've, you've fixed it, to test it, you can also just put on a standard 
20, um, standard ATX power supply and you will be just fine. So if you have any more questions, I have links in the description to this adapter so you can get it for yourself. Get the 160 watt version. I would say it's not very expensive. Um, I would lengthen the wires because especially on EATX boards, this is going to be too short. And I would attach some wires at the end, like these ones, so you can attach your 12 volts from your power supply onto them. I'm going to show you the clips that I use. These are the crocodile clips coming from our power supply. These need to be thick cables so they can ca carry all the amps and these I usually just clamp onto here. So this one would be the 12 volt one. I just clamp it onto there and I have the same for ground and for this clamp. The next tools that I have are analyzers. This one is my DDR analyzer that I use. This is also from AliExpress, have the link down below. This has postcodes on this side and this has also debugging LEDs. And not only that, it has like reset, and reset LED. This has uh, another reset LED there. And then at the very top, you can see a VTT. There is going to be an LED in for VPP. And there is some more for like clock stuff on the back side. And there are multiple ways you could connect it with this header, for example, for, with these two, you could also co connect it to like a COM debug port if you don't use DDR. But in my opinion, the most important thing is that you can plug this in into DDR3 and into DDR4. This thing, I'm still getting quite used to it because I need to learn some of the postcodes that it, this gives because this gives different postcodes than this thing does. So this thing was very valuable though to me and I could never live without this anymore because this thing is great because it's so easy to attach and every board has either DDR3 or DDR4. So this is a big recommend if you want to fix boards. Next thing is this TL611 Pro. This card was great at the beginning and now it's kind of hard to use to be honest because you expect just to plug in PCIe and everything will be good, but very few boards support debugging through PCIe. What I use this mostly for is the PCI. Through PCI, it always works. With PCI, I always have postcodes. So every time I can, I use the PCI adapter, this one, and the PCIe most of the time just shows PCIe reset and 3VSB if that is running. The other times what I do with this is use this LPC or this LPC connector. This is the old standard with thick ones where thick pins come in and this is the newer standard where more tiny ones come in. Important, you need to be careful of pin 1 as you can see here that is marked there and also on this one. This often plugs into TPM, especially TPM at the moment. On almost every board you can find a TPM header, then it's either going to be the thick pins from this one or this one. And be careful of the orientation, because of the orientation of main boards often have pin 1 marked, and it doesn't always have to be this side that you are facing the post LEDs. It can be that the L um, post Postcodes are away from you. So be careful how you plug this thing in. There's some other debug ports or COM ports where this also can be connected, but those weren't always reliable when I used it. The most reliable were TPM and PCI. But this thing is great. There's another version of this, like TL622 or something like that. I have no idea what the difference is, to be perfectly honest. I was asked that in the comments and I sadly couldn't answer. But this thing worked great for me. And um, also has debug LEDs, which are great. And you need to get used to the postcodes. Um, I have done quite some time with this now. And I know what some of the postcodes mean. But that's just something experience is going to tell you. Next thing you may be going to know from my very first video that I did on how to repair RAM banks 
or test RAM banks. This is a DDR4 and DDR3 tester, I believe. Does it say DDR3 at the top there? No, it does not, huh? It might be only a DDR4 tester, to be honest. I've just used it for DDR4. This what you can see here is the turn on switch. Mine came broken, so I just replaced the switch. Yours probably is going to have a click button, <clears throat> which I don't really like. Which is why I got a flip switch onto there. And what you can see right here, the Sharpie has marked the LEDs that are most of the time not on. These, as far as I know, are for ECC memory. Only if you use ECC, you could use these LEDs. And what is also important, mostly on AMD, in the middle right here, there's like three rows of LEDs that most of the time do not turn on. So it's very important for you to mark these LEDs like I did here so you know which one shouldn't turn on because it could uh, lead you on a false way, false path where you search a problem that isn't there. But other than that, this tester is great. It works that the, uh, the ones that are connected are going to light up and the, um, the ones that are not connected are not going to light up. So if you're missing some LEDs, you know they they you have broken li lines, either data lines or whatever lines. There's a Russian version of this where it's done a lot smarter, where it works in reverse. So only if something is broken, an LED shows up, which which is way smarter and works way better because you don't have 200 LEDs flashing. You have only a single LED flashing if it's broken. Instead of like this, where you have a lot of LEDs, where it's hard to see the one that is not um, that is not on, instead of seeing the only single one that is on. But the still thing, this thing still works. And as you saw in my very first video, I fixed in Z170 Titanium X Power Gaming board with this, and it worked. Next quick thing I want to discuss: the solder that I use is leaded solder. I know it's bad. I know it's not healthy for you, but I use it. This is just some very old German solder. You're probably not going to find anything under this name because it's not freely available anymore. But I, I just I want lattice solder because the solder is so much better. The melting point is so much lower. I do have safety precautions that I'm going to show you later, but I need lattice solder. That is what I'm going to also recommend to you, if you start, get a little solder and get something um, that is putting away the fumes like uh, I will show you later. One small little thing I want to show you. This is my Dremel that I use. If I need to run jumpers, I use this Dremel tool to get away, to put the mask away, to Dremel the mask away off the board. I use a very fine tip and this just plugs into the wall. And this is what I use to get away with the mask, uh, put away the mask off a board. So another thing that you already know, this is my BIOS programmer. This is the very cheap CH CH341A. This thing is good uh, good for the beginning, but actually isn't really that good, as I was told. Um, this does a lot of things, doesn't do a lot of things that you need if you want to get into a more advanced motherboard repair. But for the beginning, this is great. And this can help you fix a lot of problems, fix a lot of BIOSes and EPROMs. I, at the, for, the, for a beginner, this is very cheap and does the job. If you want to get more involved, you need a different one. And I'm still on the lookout for a different one because I want uh, to get a, another one that is better than this. And that is especially faster. This comes with a lot of adapters, like this adapter where you can put the chip in and that clamps onto the chip. Hopefully you can see. That clamps onto the chip you would put in there so you don't have to solder. Then there's the 1.8 volt adapter that you already know. There's this clamp that I've never used. I've tried like twice or three times and it never worked out for me. I hate these things. There might be ones with pogo pins or something that could work, but I never do this. I always unsolder the chip. Or what I do, 
is use this little adapter. This is what I was talking about with the MSI board, where I just connected all of these pins, all of eight of those, with these jumper cables onto the pin header. This is the one other method that I use to flash BIOSes. So the next thing I want to show you is my Reball jig. This thing you've probably seen on many other channels. This, as you can see here, screws out and screws in, where you can fix the, the chip onto these jaws right here. And this has a top, which attaches like this. It is magnetically attaches, where you can partially pull it apart where the stencil then fits in. Let's see, I have a stencil right here. Theoretically, the stencil would then sit in there, something like that, and you would put on the top cover. You can then pour the balls into here, and then take them out again from this ramp. I haven't used this too much, but it was pretty great. The good thing is it's very heavy, it's very sturdy, and yeah, one more thing that I've used is this small thing, which I like very much for doing small DDR chips, where the chip gets clamped in between these two jaws and gets held with the spring in place. This is also very cheap, and for the beginning this was great. And I would always recommend get something that has a few universal stencils like these ones, on the bottom here that have small ones just as a universal one. This for example is just from some iPhone I think uh, which is these specific ones but I'm never going to use those. What I'm going to use are these universal ones to to be able to reball a chip. I, I needed to use this on a MacBook that I fixed where I needed to reball a backlight driver. And now you can see my other tools that you already know. First thing I want to talk about is this guy right here. This is an Action T3TB, I think. C245 or T245. This is my soldering iron. As you can see, if I turn it on on the back, it turns on, shows you the temperatures, shows you what tool I have to the T245. And as you can see right here, this is my soldering station. This is the soldering iron itself that I use. This is the sand for it. And it, it shuts down or cools down automatically if you put it in. These are, there are the tips that I use. This is the big one, shovel one. This helps for a lot of things, for, re uh, for cleaning um, ball grit arrays. This is a default one that I use. This one I don't really use. This is not a genuine G a JBC, so this one sucks. This I use for micro soldering. This is a very small one. And I also use this big guy here for anything that needs to have a lot of thermal mass. If I could get it to focus. All of these are linked in this description so you can get them. Always make sure you get genuine JBC ones. Only then this action 3TB is actually worth it. Before this, I was using a TS100, which was a great soldering iron, but it's nothing compared to this. This thing has so much power, this is so great, and the JBC tips are just really good quality tips, so get them. Um, this one here, this is my hot air station, as you can see, this one right here. This is a, um, basically a quick 861DW, but it's just a knockoff. It works just fine, which looks like the same thing as the quick one. It's cheaper, I think this one was 230 uh, euros, and it just works fine. I love this thing. This thing is a great upgrade from the one that I was using before. Yeah, just just see for if you could get a good knockoff like I did. This is, I think, HN Star or Instar or anything like that. Um, next thing that I want to show you is my Switch One Power Supply. This one is actually uh, listed in the description as well. This does 0 to 30 vo volts and up to 10 amps at every one of those. 
voltages. So up to 300 watts of power. Um, this does current limiting and voltage limiting with these two knobs. I'm not going to turn it up right now because I have the uh, mining adapter connected to it and it can only handle 12 volts. So I'm going to stick with 12 volts. But I would, I would, I really like this thing for the beginning. It would be great to get a linear power supply, but those are really expensive and really hard to get. And if I would get another power supply, I would either get another one of these to have two or one with dual outputs and I would might get one that does like 20 amps or 15 at least because I sometimes hit the limit of 10 amps on here but for most things this is enough you have a ground and a red one here for power to connect to these are banana jacks but um, they also unscrew as you can see here and what I do is I crimp these connectors onto here as you can see the screw hole connectors and just going to uh, put them on there because the banana jacks are actually like screws that are stick out that are sticking out and you could put it onto them next big thing i want to talk about is this great thing here this is my microscope that you uh, that you see me use that i solder on this is an add-on star i have the exact model link down below and it's mounted with a boom arm to my desk using a 3d printed adapter to hold it in place so this boom arm originally is made for either phone holding or for a lamp but i've re reconstructed it with the with this plastic thing plastic adapter this i found online and it's just put in and this is an led light ring 144 leds i think um this is not too great, uh, got to be honest. It's okay for the things I use it for, but there's way better ones with anti-glare and everything. And I would recommend you to look for anything like that. But for the beginning, this works great. And the next thing is that you see, can see quite some connectors of these of the microscope. And you can see the microscope is on right now, but the uh, LCD is black because I've got it hooked up to this TV right here. So this is how I'm using the microscope. I got a big TV here. So I am soldering under here and using the microscope like this while just looking at the TV. This is way better for my eyes. And I got quite used to doing it like this with a digital microscope and with the camera. Next thing here that didn't isn't important to you yet because I haven't shown it too much is my 3d printer this is an old one this is an anycubic i3s mega or something like that it's quite old by now but still does the job i only print pli so far and yeah i cannot say that i recommend it anymore because it's old and there are way better variants with like auto bed leveling and so on and so forth but i don't want to get into 3d printing right now what you can see back there this is my compressor this has compressed air. This is very useful for many things that I do to clean up things. And speaking of cleaning, we have good old IPA. 99.9% .9 isopropyl alcohol. Always would recommend this stuff for cleaning. It's great, especially if you use a lot of flux. This, uh, I cannot live without this, this anymore. Next thing what I want to talk about are my test GPUs. This is a GT. 310 from NVIDIA and this is an RX 460. This is for a little bit more power. This has DVI, HDMI and DisplayPort and the good thing is this is a 75 watt GPU that uses no external power. So there's no external power connected to it and this one is a low profile one with DVI and DisplayPort. I really like to use these two. This one if I actually want to test the board under a little bit of stress with Formark or something. And this one most of the time for booting because it's low profile, it takes a lot, a very little power and is easy to connect through DVI through what I capture my videos. So the next thing, big thing is this little box right here. As you can see, I have my microscope connected to it, my PS on button and my fans. If I flip this switch, my fans turn on. 
and I use these fans to draw out the toxic fumes. I still need to get a filter for it. So there's uh, an active coal filter that you can get that you can attach to this. Um, these stands are 3D printed as well. So the fans can stand upright and draw air through here out on the back where I have a window. And these fans get 19 fat 19 volts. So they spin a lot faster and can draw way more air out. This is important. I've tried to use these with 12 volts, which was way too little. And with 19 volts, they worked great. So as an explanation, what this, this thing is, we need to get under my table. And as you can see, there's an ATX24, uh, ATX power supply mounted on there. So I have this tw uh, ATX power supply to supply different voltages to many things on my desk. For example, my microscope takes 5 volts from this box right here. These fans take 19 volts drawn from here. There's 12 volts coming into the step-up converter right here and putting out 19 volts that, that, that goes to the fans. The LED light right here, this one, takes also 5 volts taking from the, from the adapter. And I also have the option to connect 24 volts, 24 pin and 8 pin adapters from that power supply. So I still use that power supply as an actual ATX power supply to test boards sometimes. And as you can see, I can turn off either my scope, my fans singly from this, and I can also turn the whole PCU on and off with this flip switch right here. This enclosure is also 3D printed. I made this myself. And yeah, so I have access to 3.3 volts, 5 volts and 12 volts just from this box right here. Next thing I want to talk about are these tweezers. I, these are long tweezers, AT11JP. I really love these. These are very, very sharp at the tip. These break super fast. If you drop them, they're probably dead. But they are so sharp and I love to use these, especially if they still go well together like these ones still do. I love to use them. They are so great. You, ca you can't do any prying or anything like that with these because they just break off the tip. But for grabbing components, placing them and rearranging them, these are great. I would definitely recommend these. These are, as I said before, AT11JP. Another very important tool is this C Compact. This is my thermal camera. This is very handy for the beginning. Sadly, it's very expensive. I think it's about 300 euros. It is USB Type C and only compatible with Android, not with Apple. And what I would recommend is to check out Infrared, I think they're called, the T2 or P2 or something like that, because this thing is okay but it's missing a macro lens that you can buy for this thing, but the infrared uh, comes with one and has, I think, a higher frame rate and a higher resolution. So I wouldn't recommend this one, but this isn't bad. Now I want to show you my tool organizer. This is a very small thing, 3D printed, with a lot of compartments for various small things, spudgers, tweezers, and many more. This is 3D printed out of two parts, uh, three parts even. The lower part with no holes in it, the upper part that's, uh, that has holes in it, and the, these connecting rods. Very easy print and makes for a very nice stand for all of your tools. So the next big thing is my oscilloscope. This one is quite beefy. It also costs a lot of money. I wouldn't recommend this for the beginner, but I actually need this for other things, things uh, like university. This is a Rigol DAS1054. This is the 4 channel 50 megahertz 1 giga sample version. And this comes very handy when you need to check all the crystals on the main board, want to check them. Um, I could even check signals simultaneously, like on the SIO, I would have been able to check multiple signals, where, how they rise, how they fall and trigger on them. But this is way overkill. You don't need something as big as this one, even though 
if you want a good four channel oscilloscope i would recommend this because it's really good quality and it's not as expensive as many other tools are so big recommend if you are willing to spend the money and go deeper with this one more thing i want to talk about is that you're going to need a whole lot of this this is everything that I can swap in and known good parts for mainboard. Starting from various different CPUs from 8th gen, 6th gen, 6th gen, more 6th gen, 3rd and 2nd gen, 10th gen, right here 11th gen, 8th gen, 9th, 9th gen of Intel processors, different generations of Ryzen 5s and Ryzen 3s and RAM, a lot of RAM, DDR4 at least. You need at least four sticks to test all the RAM ba banks simultaneously. Then I have a lot of DDR3 also laying around. I have SODEM laying around in case I do notebooks at any time. And SSDs, SATA connected and NVMe connected. So you can test a lot of different boards and you have all of the tools on hand. And very important is to have them checked that they work. Because for example, I have this i5-8400 that is dead that has caused a lot of trouble because I had like three boards that I thought were dead, had a problem, but in reality, just my test processor was dead. Another small thing I want to show are these cabinets right here. These are drawers I can draw out. And these hold all of my spare parts. These, for example, are SMD resistors that are held here and a lot of soldering tools. And as you can see, there's quite some more of these. These are used for various and various of my parts that I order on time. Some SMD, some through hole and so on and so forth. I now want to wrap up the video. The last few things I want to talk about is this camera that you're looking through here. This is my phone. This is a OnePlus 7. I hopefully will upgrade this soon because the camera quality really isn't great and I want to improve on that. Hopefully I can get a different kind of camera or a different phone. Another thing, you can hear me through my HyperX Cloud 2. This is uh, usually just a gaming headset. So I want to replace that with a proper microphone as well. So you can hear less of my breathing, more of my talking, and I would be more clear. Another thing that I use, if you see the bottom right camera, that is sometimes used for displaying the current. That is my iPad that just uh, uses a, I use as a camera as well. And I capture all of my footage through cheap capture cards, most of the time HDMI capture cards, and I use OBS to film all of this. So this was a wrap up. I hope you enjoyed the video. There are a lot of tools that I haven't talked about, but these were the most important ones that you need. A lot of experience is going to tell you what tools you're going to need and what not. But this was a quick sum up of what I use. If you liked the video, the thumbs up button, subscribe to the page. And I hope I can see you in another video. Thank you very much and goodbye.